it's really an honor to be here and to be part of the India Science Festival and the Night Science Journalism Program is happy to be a knowledge partner in the festival. Uh, we have a uh, workshop on fact checking coming up later this week. And so thank you for hosting me here. I'm going to talk about uh, lessons that we learn on reporting on crisis, particularly based on the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have a, 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 a slideshow or a PowerPoint that I hope to share with you that I am going to use to illustrate some of those points for you. Uh, hang on, here we go. Um, so reporting science during a crisis, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm the director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT, which is a 40 year old program. Well, it will be 40 years old next year, which is, has the purpose of training science journalists and, and trying to improve the integrity and authenticity and uh, storytelling, uh, everything about good science journalism. And I'm basing this talk, of course, on the COVID-19 pandemic. This is, uh, everyone probably by this point has seen one of these images. This I is found a, this on the web. This is an animation, uh, essentially an animation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what you see there coming out of it are the spike proteins that the virus uses to attach to human cells. And, and I'm dwelling on this for just a minute because these spike proteins, as we know, are not only how the virus attaches, but when we talk about mutations in the virus, for instance, the difference between the Delta variant and the Omicron virus. We're almost entirely talking about mutations in these spike proteins. And these changes, for instance, with Omicron, allow the virus to engage some escape immunity um, because it, it looks different to the immune system, um, which tends to target these spike proteins. Okay, one. Pandemics will remind you of how important science journalism is. How do we get the news about a crisis, a, a pandemic, a volcanic eruption, as we saw recently in Tonga, uh, climate change? Where do we get this information? And primarily, we get this either from official sources or we hope independent sources and independent sources should be journalism. By my definition of journalism, science journalism and all journalism, journalism is independent inquiry. So with pandemics will remind you that we need independent sources of information telling us what's going on in any kind of a crisis because we want um, sources of information without a, an agenda. We just want, this is journalism at its best actually, but we want accurate and honest information about what's going on. So for instance, I have put up these two maps of COVID uh, in my country, the United States and in India, um, that to take a look at what's going on today. And these are from the New York Times uh, coronavirus tracker from yesterday. So if you look at these two maps and they're color coded, so the deeper and darker the red, the more COVID-19 you're gonna find, you'll see that India at this moment looks a lot better than the United States. This is local reporting. This is from the New York Times and the, and the United States at this moment with the Omicron variant is a bonfire of COVID-19 and India looks not as if there's no coronavirus in the country at this moment, but mostly a whole lot better with just a few areas that are shading into darker and darker. Um, but let's put this in a global context. Uh, journalism is not only local, but global. And when we're talking about what's going on in our own countries, we need to also think in any crisis, again, going back to the um, a volcanic eruption in Tonga, there were uh, tsunami waves, you know, in many countries around the world related to that, you know, where were they most severe? Or in this case, coming back to COVID, where is COVID most severe right at the moment? You, you see it in Europe and you see it in a small part of sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, you see it in 
North America in spades. So when we're talking about what's going on in our own country, we also want to put it in some kind of global context. We don't want as journalists to live in our local, regional, or even national bubble. What's going on here compared to what's going on everywhere else? Because this gives us a kind of measurement of how well we're doing, right? If we were only looking at India or we were only looking at the United States, right? We would have no real sense of, of who's doing well and who's not doing well. And right now, of course, the United States is doing terribly, but this global map illustrates that. It's important in any crisis um, and certainly in any pandemic uh, to remember that we've done this before. This is an illustration from the bubonic plague era of the Middle Ages. Um, it, and what I like particularly about it is the, this uh, cartoon, the doctor in question is wearing a plague mask, right? And so at this time in Europe, people did not understand at all how the plague was spread, which we believe now is primarily through fleas and rats. But, you know, it was magically spreading. And so the assumption that it was that it was in the air and the assumption was that a mask might help protect you. Right. So we've been in these places before. This is hundreds of years earlier and we're in which we're in a crisis situation where we don't fully understand and we're trying out different ways to protect ourselves until we figure out what works. Um, and there are other lessons from history in the same sense. Again, in this particular moment, I'm thinking pandemics. Um, this is the 1918, 1919 um, influenza pandemic. And I want to make a couple of points here that also help us give some context to where we are today. One is this pandemic killed a lot more people so far than we've seen with COVID-19. Not that we haven't seen millions of deaths, and I believe we're over 6 million by now globally and past 800,000 in the United States alone, um, and, and hundreds of thousands in, in many other countries. Um, but the pandemic has followed the same kind of, the pandemic that we see now has followed these same kinds of peaks and waves. <clears throat> and I want to mention them. Again, this is, these are 1918 photos. So you see people masks, you see people carrying bodies, very classic for what we see today. But you also see the kind of rise and fall of a pandemic. And so in this case, you see the initial rise then a flattening out during the summer, people are more outside, they're not packed together, especially in Northern climates, it's not as um, cold. So you, you, know, you get a little more uh, buffer of good weather from the virus. And then you see this enormous peak rising out of the winter of 1918. You know. So what is behind that? That was clearly the worst peak. And then you'll see it again in 1919, there was some mutation of the virus. And so if we look at this and it became more infectious, it was an influenza A virus, uh, which is avian influenza. It became more infectious. People, many more people caught it. Many more people got sick. The total from this pandemic is 25 million. So thank goodness we're not at a minimum, actually. We're not there yet, but you're seeing a classic behavior of a virus in a large pool of hosts. You know, what drives mutations? Many, many, many people getting sick and the virus having all kinds of opportunities to repl replicate. And viruses are replication machines, right? It's not that they're brilliant, but their design is to replicate. And so when they vary and there's a more successful replication, that's where the virus is going to kind of lean, essentially. And so you see this again in 1918, and this was entirely predictable in this particular pandemic. And I was having a talk conversation last week with some science journalists um, from Science Magazine and virologists and immunologists and I said to them, do we expect another variant of concern? And as you know, the WHO tracks these by variants of interest, variants, variants of interest, variants of concern. The big waves have been related to variants of concern. And everyone I talk to says we should 
given how many people are infected at this moment, expect another variant of concern and possibly another wave in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as journalists, this is also a reminder that we should not repeat the mistakes of the past. Don't be hyperbolic, right? Don't oversell what's going on. Don't overstate the risk or the dangers. This is a Time Magazine cover from the 1968 bird flu pandemic, which was another avian influenza. Um, and, you know, it's got this giant hammerhead of a headline death threat, right, over a chicken, which I find hilarious. But, but we need not to do this. Let's be honest and let's be accurate about what the risk is. Again, if I go back very briefly to my example of the uh, volcanic eruption from Tonga and the um, tsunami waves, you did not see any journalists saying, and these are going to be towering 20 foot waves because they weren't, right? Tsunami waves are not necessarily, they can be, but in many cases, they are not necessarily that. So we don't want to overstate that. We don't want to stereotype the source of a particular you know, crisis, and we don't want to drive people to panic. We want to give them as accurate information as we can. And, and in a situation like this, we actually don't have to overstate it. You know, the situation can often be bad enough as it is. We want to keep the smart things we've learned from previous crises or pandemics. Um, this is from the African Ebola outbreak in 2014 and Ebola is real is what the sign says. So one of the things that we've learned from previous crises and certainly from previous pandemics is that they generate a lot of misinformation. They did in the Ebola outbreak. They certainly are doing this in COVID-19 and it's our job as journalists to try to counter misinformation and disinformation as much as we can. Um, for instance, all of the misinformation, this is a little pixelated, but I love the sign, COVID-19, mRNA vaccines will change your DNA. This is an anti-vax sign. This is completely erroneous. These are mRNA vaccines, but the, but the vaccines themselves do not have coding to change anything. They have a tiny replication of a snippet of the viral mRNA that the immune system recognizes. And one of the best ways I saw countering this disinformation is this campaign out of Australia, actually, in which they say the mRNA vaccine is like a most wanted poster. It tells your body how to recognize COVID-19, right? It's, it's just this tiny piece that the immune system recognizes as something alien and generates um, defenses against, that's all it is. And the adenovirus vaccines like J&J &J or, or AstraZeneca, just the same, right? They use a slightly different model, but basically they're providing a, a you know, information to the immune system so it can gen up a, a response against it, right? And so, some of the problem with this kind of misinformation is that people are not informed enough or educated enough about how the vaccines work or, and often people don't understand the importance of herd immunity from vaccination, but we can counter this and we can use this as a target of opportunity to um, spread accurate and good information. Well, we, this is a project of uh, KSJ that we have ongoing on a couple of fronts. Um, I mentioned that we're going to have a fact-checking um, uh, workshop in the India Science Festival later this week. We also have a free downloadable handbook for people who edit science stories. A lot of science tra journalism training targets reporters rather than editors. So we're trying to focus on editors. This handbook is available for free download at the moment in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, we're working on a couple of additional translations and partnerships with different groups. And one of those is going to be in Farsi, and one is going to be in um, traditional and simplified Chinese. Um, but I wanted to show you this from the fact-checking uh, project because it'll give you an idea of what a journalistic fact check looks like. This is actually uh, a fact check on a story we ran in the magazine Undark, which is published 
by KSJ, and which is a science mag digital science magazine focused on science and society. Fact checkers go into the text. They annotate every single fact that they find, as you see here. They come up with a list of questions and, and put the, the journalists themselves through this kind of rigorous scrutiny. Is this right? Is this right? You're right. And our fact checkers in general on a story that has 6,000 to 8,000 words will find at least 1,000 facts that have to be double checked, right? So you see the, the response to the fact checker over here, like, I don't know if you can see this, but it marks places in a transcript where the actual quote comes from. And we want this. It's not fact check, post fact check, oops, let's correct this. It's let's get us let's get it right going first. And if we're going to have integrity, we're going to get it right. And finally, and I think this is really important in journalism um, on, the, on the subject of disinformation, uh, it's the importance of repetition. There's a sort of cultural uh, part of journalism that says, well, we already did that story. Why would we do it again, right? That's not news, we've done it before. And so there, here's this quote. It's actually from the 18th century. Do not fear to repeat what has already been said. Men, it's the 18th century, so it's just men. Men need the truth dinned into their ears many times from all sides. The first rumor makes them prick up their ears. The second registers and the third enters. And it may be more than that, but I use this a lot when I'm talking to journalists. You know, it's on us to say, yes, we have to keep repeating the truth. How can we tell that story in a way that makes it more, you know, accessible? So I'm going to go fairly quickly through the rest of these because I know I have a time limit. Just as a reminder for, to all journalists that we approach official sources with caution because our readers and listeners and viewers do. Uh, as an example of that, the uh, previous U.S. President Donald Trump talking about how the fact that he played down the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. He, you know, did his best not to let people know how bad it was. He didn't want to, he's saying here he didn't want to create panic, but he also did not want to make his government look bad with accurate numbers. Um, it's important to remember for all of us that facts will change during any crisis or any pandemic. You know, what we know at first is going to change. And that doesn't mean that science is wrong. That just means that science, like the rest of us, is a learning curve, right? What is science anyway? It is people trying to understand the world around us. So if the facts change during the pandemic, we consider that a normal part of the process. Here is a cover of a photo from Science Magazine in March 2020 in which everyone believed that the answer to the pandemic was disinfection. This is in China where they're spraying giant clouds of disinfection. Later, we realized that surfaces were not the problem and it was more airborne transmission. But then we had a quite a bit of debate, how airborne, how far did the virus spread, right? We're figuring this out and that is completely normal. And we need to let people realize that if the idea about what going on changes, that's not science getting it wrong, that's science learning more. It's important to have, you know, good, honest, accurate sources, not only vet your sources, but vet your numbers. I, I like this one because if you look at these numbers, it suggests that there's a wildfire of COVID. This was early in the pandemic. In South Korea, nothing going on in the US, but going back to what the Donald Trump thing, if you, if you drill down, you see, we, we just weren't testing. There were only 4,000, there were only 25,000 tests in the United States. There were almost 3,000 tests in North and South Korea. And so, you know, you need to vet the numbers. What are they really telling you? Um, pandemic lines are storylines. This is from an infectious disease reporter at Nature who just wants to point out that there's narrative in pandemic and we can use that. The first rule of narrative writing is to center it around a person and, and the basic structure of a narrative story. Um, if you're a journalist, get your hero in trouble and keep her there, right? So your hero, the scientist at the center of your story or the um, 
you know, father or mother at the center of the story is confronting an obstacle and they don't resolve the obstacle to the end of the story. That's basic narrative. It's also more important to be responsible than provocative, right? So you want your story to be grounded in what's real. And finally, going back to my point about not having all the answers, we don't have all the answers. So if you look at confirmed cases of Omicron in December, you see these hot spots, right? They're pretty isolated. Um, South Africa was the first country to report Omicron, so that's why you see a lot there. And there's a was a lot of traffic between South Africa and Europe, so you see a lot in Europe. Almost nothing in the United States. Could you have predicted that a month later it would be this? Probably not, right? So we have to allow for that too. And finally, um, and this is where I always like to close this talk, you know, ethics matter. Um, ethics matter in journalism. But what we mean by ethics matter is we mean that people matter, right? So that's a matter of telling these stories with respect. The people we're writing about, from scientists to patients to grieving family members to, you know, people on the front lines of medicine, transporting very sick people, everyone that we're writing about, they're, they're people and they matter. And we have to remember as journalists going forward in these stories that that's at the forefront of what we do. Um, and this is obviously a photo from a COVID war. So thank you. I, that's sort of my fast run through of issues that I find very important uh, going forward here. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have regarding that presentation. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was so lovely and such a, a smooth uh, presentation and very, very to the point. I must say there was absolutely no uh, waste of time. And I'm very excited for the qu kind of questions that we have for you here today. So let's get started with the audience Q&A. Uh, we've collected a few over social media from our YouTube live stream, as well as uh, the ones that we have received in the Q&A tab. Okay, so look, okay. a couple of our attendees have already done their homework on you. So <laughs> our <laughs> question is here um, that says, very curious to know about the inspiration behind Monkey Wars. So oh, if you could uh, you. shed some light on the same. So Monkey Wars was a newspaper series that I did when I was a science writer in California working for the Sacramento Bee, um, which won a Pulitzer Prize and went on to be my first book. And I was, had been a science writer then for about over a decade. And one of the things I had realized was that it's really hard to give your readers, the general public, a sense of what animal research really is. And that's in part because a lot of scientists are very wary of talking publicly about what they do. You know, they feel under attack often by animal rights people or by members of the public, and sometimes they really are under attack, right? And so they tend to not want to talk about it. And I had spent a lot of time, you know, talking to scientists, I'd say, I'd like to write about your research. And they'd go, no, I'm not going to talk about that, you know, how I study the lungs of dogs, right? I don't want people to know that. So at one point, I realized um, that the state of California tracked every single monkey that came into the state of California, right? They, and that I could get this through a Public Record Act request. And so I filed in the way that you're trying to get documents that aren't generally available, a legal request for five years worth of where do monkeys go in California. And then I had a roadmap of every laboratory in California that used monkeys. And so from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to use this roadmap and I'm going to file more documents. Well, you know, the welfare inspections of laboratories. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to do a story that illuminates what animal research really is using primates. And, and the other, th and I did, it took me well over a year and a surprising number of arguments, 
right? With people who, even though I had the documents, did not want to talk to me, right? I mean, a lot of arguing. Um, and I'm and I'm very stubborn. So I didn't win every argument, but I actually did win most of them. So we had access. You know, I watched surgeries on monkeys. We went to NASA to look at how they were working with monkeys. They were going to send into space to study bone demineralization. I, you know, I mean, I did a lot. I interviewed almost, I want to say about 200 people by the time I was done on that series. Um, but the last thing I want to say about that is when you're doing a big project like Monkey Wars um, and, and you're trying to eliminate an issue, you really think about, well, what is the issue that we're, I'm trying to eliminate? You have to have a very clear picture in your mind of what your, what your actual issue is. And mine was this. Uh, animal research is a, really about us because, you know, I'm not telling stories about, you know, monkeys, cute little monkeys or destructive little monkeys or however you want to look at monkeys. Um, but I'm telling a story about the fact that we're the number one species on the planet and we can do anything we want to to another species. So what does it say about us, the choices we make when we're experimenting on our closest living relatives, which are monkeys, right? Um, between 92 and 98% between monkeys and great apes shared DNA. So, but we still do all these things to them. So what are the ethical choices that we're making here? And that was really that series. It was very fascinating to do and very hard to get. And I'm really still proud of it. As you should be. I'm sure there was so much that went into creating the series and then after the book. And I mean, rightly so, you, you got the Pulitzer Prize for it. So um, kudos to you for that. So the question that we have here is, again, very interesting. So how do you draw lines, uh, if any, about what not to cover in any narrative-based story and why? I mean, how would you, how would you pick and choose? Well, there's really, that's a great question. And there's really two things. One is, you know, your ethical decision that you're going to put someone at risk by using their story, right? And I have left people out of stories. I, um, you know, I've left, in the monkey wars, I, you know, left one person out who um, felt very under attack. And so I quoted that person, but I did not use her name. Right. I mean, some, you can also do that. Um, and I, and I have left other people out for that reason, but primarily with narrative, um, you, you're picking, I mean, narrative is a, a choice of what you're going to use to make your narrative work. Right. And, and the basic arc, the basic narrative arc is conflict, crisis, resolution. Right. And if you picture that almost like the arc of a rainbow with conflict at one point at the starting point and resolution at the ending point, and then it rises to crisis. Right. So when you're figuring out that particular path, it's going to tell you a lot about what you're going to leave in and what you're going to leave out. What is my story? What are the facts that illustrate my story? What are the people who illustrate the points I want to make? How do I pull the reader all the way through this, right? And so a lot of times you have to think about, you know, what you add on as a side trip. I'm taking the reader on this journey. The reader only has so many patients uh, to go veering off on side trips away from my main narrative. So what am I going to have to leave out of this story? And I'll tell you, as someone who loves stories, sometimes I, I've left out stories that I really love. So then I come back and tell another story, right? So, But you do have to be really ruthless. Your story needs to move the reader forward. And if you slow it down by, you know, too many kind of digressions, then, you know, they may leave and you don't want them to do that. Well, thank you for answering that, Deborah. I think uh, with, with a lot of questions that we're receiving, I think we're really going to delve very deep into your process of writing. And with that, uh, let's move on to the next question. So while you write your uh, narrative pieces or stories, how do you make a distinction between creating a grabby headline versus a clickbait headline? How do you, no. <laughs> what's the line? So writers don't write headlines normally, right? Normally at any, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick a newspaper or a magazine for my example, but, but it could be a website. Um, 
the journalist writes the story and the editor writes the headline. Now, and sometimes, like, especially in my newspaper past, I never saw the headline before the reader did. And sometimes I was just as horrified and would go storming into the office, yelling and waving my hands about the headline. You can, if you're a reporter working on a particularly, uh, you know, controversial story, say to the editor, I really want to see that headline before it goes out, right? But often in the same way that everyone has territory, you know, editors are like, they don't want to give the reporter, that's their job. It's not your job, right? Even when I wrote for the New York Times, often I didn't see the headline ahead, right? So you need to be really aware. People yell at reporters all the time about the headlines, and often it's not them. Well, here's when I was a blogger at Wired, I wrote my own headlines and they were great, right? <laughs> but, but mostly you don't get to do that. Um, but here is where it is, it is responsibility of the journalists, as I kind of implied. If you're working on a story that has a lot of nuance, to go, go to the editor and make sure that they're very aware of the, the fact that there are sort of landmines if you don't acknowledge the nuance in the headline. And I've seen, you know, over the last few years, both the New York Times and the Washington Post have had to redo headlines. You know, the story comes out, the headline's a disaster. They end up redoing the headline, right? Leaving the story just the same. So that converse behind the scenes conversation about headlines, it's too easy for reporters to say, well, that's the editor. And it is the editor. It, you know, there's times where the reporter really needs to stand up on that front. Thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, a lot isn't in the hands of the reporter, because at the end of the day, I guess the editor takes a call on what sells and what doesn't. So <laughs> that's... And I'm against clickbait headlines. And when I read, see these headlines that are something like, guess what this scientist said about washing your hands? I go, I'm not going to read that right? Tell me what they said, right? That's ridiculous. You're just trying to get me to click. I hate those clip headlines, actually. So, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the next question that we have here. Um, very interesting one again. Uh, how do you stay objective and not add your opinions uh, to a science story? Is it okay for science journalists to pick sides while reporting science? Yes. <laughs> So that's a, a really important question in science journalism, and it gets to something that we talk a lot about in the community, which is the problem of false balance, right? When you follow the political model of reporting is always to have two or more sides, right? In the United States, we have two primary political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, so political reporters tend to, you know, there are two, so two sides, two opinions, right? But in science, that's not always necessarily true. Often you have the weight of the evidence sits here and there's a consensus. And then over here are some outlier or, you know, contrarian opinions. And it, it actually is what we all agree that we totally blew that on climate change reporting, right? That the weight of the evidence was that man-made climate change existed. But because science writers, especially in the late 20th century, were following the political reporting model that, you know, the oil and gas industry had these, what I'm going to call tame scientists who would always say, oh, no, this isn't really real. And you would report as if these were two equally weighted points of view when, in fact, you know, most of the scientists didn't think that. And so that was inaccurate reporting. And so I am not I don't I don't think there are two sides to every issue in science. Right. If, if there was a contrarian scientist and you may remember this, there was a contrarian scientist with HIV who said that HIV wasn't a virus, right? It was transmitted by some uh, something that he hadn't even figured out. And he got a ton of publicity, but that was garbage, right? So in the case of reporting on science, here's the responsibility of the reporter. The responsibility of the reporter is to figure out where the weight of evidence lies. What's the consensus of science? And, and that is an opinion. You 
do enough reporting to say, yes, this is where the body of evidence is. And this is how I tell the story. This is what's real. And I may acknowledge that people don't agree with that, but I, then I need to clearly identify them as contrarian or a spokesman for, you know, the oil and gas industry in the case of climate change. And that's my job. My, I don't leave the reader guessing as to what's real. I let them know what's actually going on. I feel very strongly about that. Thank you for being so candid in your response. Um, I, as I speak with you, I further understand the, the kind of responsibility that actually science journalists hold uh, in their hands. And I don't think we talk about this often. It's such, it's enormous responsibility. Uh, and that actually brings me to the next question that we have here. Um, what, uh, how does science journalism differ from regular journalism? So what are some things that set apart science journalism from the rest? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, at one level, hang on. <coughs> at one level, we're not different at all, right? Theoretically, we're all in this together and we are all uh, journalists pursuing independent inquiry of our subjects, right? And, and reporting on, you know, what the news is and digging deeper into what are the sort of mechanics that go behind any story and, and, and report. And when people get things wrong or when scientists make mistakes or scientists behave badly, science journalists should report on that in the same way that political reporters report on badly behaving politicians. At one level, we're all the same. It's really your understanding of science probably that separates the two. And you will certainly hear both scientists and science journalists complaining about other reporters, general news reporters who cover science issues and don't understand the science and get things wrong or display the fact that they don't understand it. I was once at a a uh, press conference at the American Astronomical Society meeting in which a television reporter asked um, if the sun was a star. A and I just wanted to put my head in my hands, right? Right. At least go out and do your homework. So I don't think you have to be necessarily be trained in science to be a good science journalist. Many of the best science journalists I know have, you know, history degrees or literature degrees, but you have to be not afraid of science. You have to be, go back to that point where I said science is, you know, people trying to understand the world around us. Don't, and science journalists learn not to treat scientists as if they're some superhuman species, right? They are people trying to understand the world around us. To, and a lot of times people who do not normally report on science are a little more awestruck about scientists, right? Um, so that's part of it. But the other part of it is the way that you build up an expertise in a given field, right? So, you know, science journalists have a, a deep imperative to do their homework. And whether I'm reporting on toxicology, which is my beat, right? So I've spent a lot of time, you know, researching chemistry and researching toxicology. And my graduate degree was environmental science and toxicology journalism, right? Um, you know, I build up that area of knowledge. And so I'm comfortable asking the right questions. And, and I think that's imperative for science journalists. You need to learn to be fearless about asking the questions that need to be asked. I think that brings in the next question very beautifully. There's a nice segue there. You spoke about toxicology. And uh, of course, um, our attendees seem to have read about the fact that you've done a lot of work in uh, forensics uh, reporting and you've written books on the same. So um, would you call yourself an investigative science reporter? Yes. Um, and if you, and I especially would base partly on my newspaper career where I did a lot of investigative reporting. Um, and, I mean, some of that was when I graduated with my undergrad, uh, I was a general news reporter, like I was just, you know, dismissing general news reporters are really important uh, and do great work. And I, and I cover the police, right? That was my first job out of college as an undergrad. And so I, you know, you learn a lot if you're covering the police about, and on the crime beat about, you know, recognizing the, the, 
the actual story has more needs more than one source and questioning authority. And so when I became a science writer, I did that. And, and the big series I did before Monkey Wars was about uh, nuclear weapons design and weapons design in the United States. And that was so investigative that it actually triggered a congressional investigation of a weapon, right? Um, and so, I, I mean, I love investigative reporting, and I think it's one of the things that makes what journalists do, which is shining light into places that some people would rather see kept in the dark, is one of the most important things we do. So I do think of myself as an investigative reporter. And because I write a lot about poison and toxicology, which often involves criminal behavior, Right. I think I've kept something of that edge. But even when you are, you know, a standard science reporter, your ability to, you know, behave like an investigative reporter um, is going to work in your favor. And just really quickly, for instance, I've been a science writer a long time. And one of the places I got sent when I was a newspaper science reporter was to Houston, where Johnson Space Center is after the shuttle Challenger blew up. And at that time, NASA was run by a, a, a gentleman whose name I've forgotten, but we had come out of the aeros, uh, you know, the military aerospace end of industry. And, and NASA wouldn't give you any information. There were 3,000 journalists in Houston, and there were no press conferences, no briefings, no. So if you weren't an investigative reporter, you know, your your paper expected you to file a story a day. If you weren't willing to go out and, you know, track people down in parking lots and, you know, and, and do investigative reporting while you were there, you weren't going to get the story. And so those skills are really important, not only to investigative journalism, but just basic good journalism. I say. Thank you. That was really amazing. That's such a chilling uh, answer. I was hooked. Um, so yeah. the next question that we have here is, uh, again, a very interesting one. So, um, you know, this is in tune with uh, the talk that you gave. And uh, this is, how did you decide which scientists to interview during the COVID-19 pandemic when so many of them had different opinions and predictions about uh, how things would pan out, how the countries, how different countries would experience the pandemic and so on. How, how did you decide? Yes, that's a great question. And, and, and it's really important when you're saying, you know, I'm going to talk to experts to be very focused on what their area of expertise is, right? So, you know, there are virologists, but some virologists are very specialized. I, I actually was listening to a reporter talk last week about the fact that David Baltimore, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning virologist in the United States, expressed all these opinions about COVID-19, but his specialty was the viruses that cause cancer. He didn't know anything about coronaviruses or infectious disease. And people quoted him because he'd won a Nobel laureate when in fact, this was not his specialty. So it's really important when you sit down and you're looking at a particular disease like uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the virus or COVID-19, you know, to say who really knows this stuff. And you'll see in news reports a lot of times the same experts quoted over and over again, Angela Rasmussen from Canada or... Uh, who's an infectious disease specialist, or Atish Jha here in Boston, who's an infectious disease specialist. And, and one of the things that uh, one of my other infectious disease reporters friends said to me is that if, you know, during the pandemic, you get a lot of um, emails from uh, publicists, you know, so-and-so is available. And she said to me, any scientist who knows what they're doing is not going to send that out, Right. They're already, they're so overwhelmed with requests already, they don't need to publicize who they are, right? So you make a short list of, uh, of the very visible scientists. And if you can't get them, what you do is you, this is what I always do when I'm doing a story anyway, I'll look at that scientist or the area in question through Google Scholar or PubMed. I like Google Scholar. Some people like PubMed better. I like Google Scholar because I like the way you can search by topic and by year really efficiently. So I'll say, okay, if I was going to pick someone like um, Angela Rasmussen, I would look at what she'd published. 
And I would look at who she'd cited and I'd say, well, even if I can't get her, here's someone who an internationally respected virologist believes is worth talking to and worth. So, you know, again, it's a matter of doing your homework. And sometimes the most visible scientists are, are not always going to give you the best insights. They're going to say the same thing over and over again. So you really want to look beyond them, but you want to look very specifically at, you know, here's my uh, uh, column of immunologists who are going to see things differently than virologists, right? If I'm going to talk about a vaccine, I want an immunologist too, right? Did the vaccine work? What did the vaccine protect against? That kind of thing. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Deborah. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, I think that's one very important uh, insight that you put in. I mean, using Google Scholar or Pub PubMed to just go through the work that the scientists have done. That's a very um, uh, important uh, uh, takeaway, I think, from what you mentioned. And uh, of course, let's move on to the next question. We still have so many to cover and we have very little time. So I'll just skim through them as soon uh, as quickly as I to talk fast. <laughs> Yeah. So um, how do you differentiate between good and bad signs, uh, especially in a crisis when there is not enough time to wait for researchers to write papers or have their opinions? Uh, how, how, how do you go about it? That's a really excellent question. And, and you're absolutely right. There's this enormous churn of papers coming out and not always peer reviewed either. Right. We've seen during the COVID pandemic, like a wash of preprints. <laughs> Uh, so there's two, maybe two or three ways. Uh, one is, again, to, to vet the scientists himself, themselves, right? Uh, what have they published before? How actually expert are they in this area? And then to vet the paper, right? First, you read the paper, right? Look at the methodology. And it's really important in a lot of these papers, you know, when someone announces that they've discovered, and don't use the word breakthrough or miracle cure or any of those awful hyperbolic things that turn out to be wrong later anyway, but um, to look at, well, what was the study, right? You know, the, did they have a control group? How many people did they test? If they tested three people, is this even meaningful? Why am I doing this? Was this a study in animals or humans, right? Um, what, what was this, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking at the efficacy of a drug and it was successful in, you know, 11 people, how, you know, what was, you know, what did it look like in the other 89 if it was 100 people and what were the side effects, right? A lot of times you really want to just go through it in a very common sense kind of way. Does this make sense, right? And, you know, and I've seen reporters because everyone is trying to get the next best story. There was a study out of Canada that I want to say overstated the risk of um, heart disease and vaccines by a factor of, it was like 10,000. They had completely gotten the math wrong. And, and yet... A lot of Canadian journalists and probably some elsewhere too, but pub wrote about that story. If it was real, the anti-vax community took those stories and, you know, went off on a marathon lap with them. The study had to be retracted. And I kept saying to my friends, who would have written about that story? Real life tells you that tens of thousands of people are not dying of heart disease from the vaccines, right? So, you know, also, you apply your own common sense filter as to whether it makes sense. Right? Do your homework, you know, think smart. Are you muted? Yeah, yeah I was. Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. I do it all the time. Uh, yeah, we'll just move to the next question then. Um, so, you have um, I mean, often spoken about uh, the work that you've done and, of course, delivered so many talks on science journalism. Um, how, how do you personally differentiate between science communication and science journalism? So what's your take on this? Thing? That's an excellent question. These are great questions. Um, so I do see them. Science journalism sits in the giant of umbrella of science communication, right? A, a, you know, in which many people are trying to tell the story of science, right? To people who are not scientists themselves or not in the science community. So, you know, at some level, there's going to be some overlap. 
in general, we think of science communication as people who are trying, who, who are goal oriented in a different way. I mean, science communicators, and by that I mean you, scientists who communicate or science writers who work for institutions or universities or associations, they want to engage the public with science and they really want the public to support science, right? It's, whereas science journalists, you know, although yes, we want to engage the public with science, same thing, we're not necessarily writing stories because we're trying to sell people on science right? We're writing stories because we want people to understand science and how it works and how it doesn't work, right? And, and have some insight into the process and be, and be able to, um, you know, use the information to make, you know, honest decisions about what's going on. So we can't sell science to do that. You know, if, if I, and I work at MIT, if I was here saying in the greatest science, um, you know, talking about great science at MIT, Right. You know, would I be trustworthy in an independent sense? No, I'm sure MIT loves hearing me use it as a bad example here. But the fact of the matter is that is that is the bright dividing line. Science journalism is not so not supposed to ever sell science and science communication can. Right. There's nothing wrong. I mean, that's not a diss on either that there, but they are different. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, both are doing significant work. And it's just um, your take on the distinction between the two. All right. Next question that we have is, um, while you go about your process of writing, how do you take the decision as to what is the language that you will be uh, choosing? I guess it depends on the medium that you're writing for. But while you write, um, are you writing for the general public or laymen or... Um, while you write for uh, laymen, do you maybe stray away from the truth by a whisker or by writing in the most scientific and objective language? Do you, do you stick to a little bit of jargon? How's your process? That's a good question. So I mostly write for the general public. They're the interesting audience to me, right? And I think this probably is something that's true for a lot of people um, in, in, in who have the kind of uh, interests that I have, which is that, uh, you know, I care about people. Who, I'm really interested in people who are, have turned away from science. And when I'm envisioning my audience, that's the audience that's most interesting to me. I know that science is the best way we have to understand the world around us. And it makes everything on earth and in, you know, the greater universes or the multi-universe or whatever is out there more interesting, right? It allows us to understand it. It illuminates these amazing things about the world that we live in. Um, and it also gives us the tools to make really important choices in public health and personal health, right? I And so you really have to feel like that science is one of the you know, tools in your toolbox. And so that audience interests me. The science savvy, science literate folks who are already standing around the science campfire, as a journalist, they're not as interesting to me. I, and I have written for that audience. I, when I first started writing about chemistry, um, I got recruited by an editor at Scientific American because there are not that many journalists who write about chemistry. And um, he said, you know, would you be interested in writing for Siam? And I said, sure. And I wrote a piece on semiochemistry. So semiochemistry, what is that? That's the chemistry of communications between living things. It's the, uh, you know, it's pheromones. It's the synchronization of chemical signals. The, the famous study that showed that women living together will synchronize their periods, right? How do they do that? There's actual chemical communication. That's semiochemistry, right? But if I write for a different audience, you know, I'm not going to use all the technical terms that I used in that article for Scientific American. I want, and I don't need to. Every, every profession has jargon. And, and when I talk to scientists and they say, well, you know, I just don't like to dumb it down. I say, that's a really insulting thing to say, right? You have jargon. Everyone has jargon. Journalism has jargon. Most scientists don't know what an inverted pyramid is. Does that mean that I'm dumbing it down when I explain what it is? No. So I like that audience and I like to figure out ways. How do I 
pull you into the science story that you don't think you're interested in, but you actually are, right? I mean, then that is so much fun. And when you pull it off, when you get people who you know have kind of got asked science to respond to you, it's, it's great. It's really important. Thank you so much, Deborah. And if, we are, if you're okay with it, can we take two more questions? Sure, sure. I'm happy to answer a couple more questions. Great. Thank you so much. Love the enthusiasm. I think it's very kind of you to be engaging uh, with all the Q uh, questions uh, uh, with such high spirits. So thank you. Uh, so one question that we have is, how do we support science journalism in multiple languages? Now, this is something that we are definitely, it's an issue that we're definitely facing in a country like India, where we have so many languages. Um, and English, uh, while it seems like English and maybe Hindi are the main two languages which are being used to disseminate uh, science um, uh, on the journalistic front. So uh, what, what's your take on promoting science journalism in different languages? I mean, I think it's really important and in part it's important in a, in a more global sense because, well, it's important locally because you want to communicate with people in the language they use, right? Um, but it's important globally because, because English tends to be the language of common currency these days, stories that are told in other languages and are not translated into English tend to not be heard globally. And yet sometimes these are really important stories. The group that I know that does, you know, the most sort of focused work on that is uh, the World Federation of Science Journalists. And I've actually been to sessions in which journalists from India and Pakistan and Egypt and uh, other countries have talked about how do I get my story out when, it, you know, English is not my first language. So the more that we can do this, the more we do simultaneous translations, the more that we publish in multiple languages. And that's why, um, you know, our KSJ handbook is in multiple languages. But, but you're also right really quickly because we, um, when we first translated that handbook into Spanish, it was um, the Spanish of Spain. And our primary audience is the Spanish of Latin America. So we actually had to revise the translation for our primary audience. And so you also have to navigate within a given you know, language, all the nuances. It's complicated, but it is a really important goal. I'm, I mean, I completely agree. There are so many layers to it. It can't really be addressed in a single go. It's, it's, it really is complicated. And um, just to inform the attendees that we've dropped the link to the KSJ Science Editing Handbook uh, in the chat. So if you want to look it up, please do. Uh, it's oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the next question for you, uh, Deborah, is that um, now you've dabbled in multiple streams and, uh, you know, topics of science. So how do you move beyond the boundaries of reporting interdisciplinary science, uh, given that you do not have a, um, I mean, if, if you don't have a science background, uh, but or have it in a different science field, how does one go about um, exploring different fields while not having uh, some knowledge of it? Yeah, that's an important question. And so, you know, I should start by saying I grew up with science. My father was a, a entomologist and chemical ecologist, right? So, uh, you know, I was really comfortable thinking about science and how it worked and all my uh, postdoc uncles of my childhood who, you know, sort of probably really influenced the way I think about this. I mean, I think, um, and I am a, myself a failed chemistry major. I started out as a chemistry major and, and switched out for to be smart about things. I mean, I think it's incumbent on science journalists to do their homework and to be straightforward about what they don't know. So I've been writing about chemistry and toxicology for 12 years, mostly. So over that time period of doing those stories and doing the research, I've learned a lot, right? I'm not a scientist, but I'm comfortable you know, talking to people about questions in that field. But I've also, you're right, you know, reported on nuclear weapons design and um, climate change and many other topics. And at that point, every good science journalist always starts by doing a ton of homework, right? If you don't start by doing that, 
then you really need to be doing something else, right? So if I want to be an expert in climate change, I spend a lot of time reading through the history of climate change, reading the important books on the subject and, and reading papers. And I, and I might even, again, going back to my Google Scholar thing, say, what are the papers in, uh, over the last 20 years, right? So what were they saying 20 years ago? Because the other thing I think we need to do as journalists because we are interdisciplinary, you know, we, we stitch together and, and it's one of the things that we do that science don't do perspectives from different fields is to really look at the history of your field, right? And, and, I, and in fact, my grad degree was partly history of science. So I'm a big believer that if you understand the history of the field and, and you spend some time studying up on the field, you will start to develop what I think of as journalistic expertise enough that you can ask smart question and not waste the time of the scientists you talk to. And the more you stay in that area, the more you're going to develop a body of knowledge. And I, and so I think that's also really important. Do your homework. Number one <laughs> message. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was so insightful. And with that, we've come to the uh, come to the end of this session and it was so so wonderful to be in conversation with you and to hear about your experiences we had a lovely time and i must thank you on uh, behalf of the entire team at isf fast india for engaging with all of the questions so wonderfully it was so kind of you and uh, there's a lot to take away from everything that you mentioned and i uh, really hope that um, you know, we get to associate with you and uh, KSJ, MIT in the coming years. I'd like to take one last question and just ask you, what's your take on public engagement platforms like India Science Festival in bringing forth scientists, researchers and public engagement practitioners to the public? What role do you think uh, platforms such as this play in bringing science closer to society? Oh, good. I'm glad you asked me that because I wanted to, you know, say goodbye by saying congratulations on the festival and all the really fascinating issues about science that you've raised. I think science festivals and science museums and these kind and, and platforms like this that engage with the public are, are so important and so valuable because you know, they're basically saying in, in, in the terms of the festival, let's have fun with this together, right? This is fascinating. Let's have fun with this. Everyone here is smart, right? And I think that's really important, right? You want people to feel smart about science and you want them to enjoy it so they can relax about it and explore it further. So no, I, I am a huge fan of science festivals and, and, you know, the work that goes around them. And, and this one is, you've done an amazing job. Congratulations.